Welcome to the course Algorithm Design. Graphs and cellular automata, they turn out to be related. Graph is a term that appears in mathematics a lot, and very often we refer to it as a, um, as a basically plot, or so we would have some data and we would top the logic. I just realized there's a typo here. Uh, I real, so it would be like a plot of, um, plot of data. Uh, but here we refer to the graph as um, something else. So basically, uh, we use this um, um, use this other term. Or so graphs are basically mathematical structures, and um, they are they in a way encode topological information uh, between um, between objects. Or so they are basically um, yeah. In, here I say kind of the model pairwise relations between objects. Or so we have objects. And they, these objects have certain relationships to each other. And usually this relationship is termed as uh, adjacency. So they are kind of, uh, they're, they're in a way that these objects are, we, would call, we will call them further on vertices. We can also call them points, but just because we represent them as points, but they are basically vertices or nodes in a graph. They are, uh, so some of them are related to each other. And we, we show this relation by basically drawing a line between two vertices. And that's uh, then uh, that's a kind of a line, that's a connection or um, a link, or in a way um, also called an edge. Uh, and that's it basically in their simplest form. Uh, graphs have no additional structure. So they just have nodes, and basically each node is in a way connected to which other nodes. This information is there, but we can, um, we can extend this, or so we can extend uh, uh, this structure further. Uh, and uh, for example, adding directionality of edges or the weight of vertices, and I'll explain these ones a little bit later in the lecture. And here there's just a, also a very small um, picture, which I will come back to. Uh, again, um, graphs can be, or graphs in a way, they're sort of um, these abstract objects, but in computer science, uh, we use three different notations to represent them. Or also in mathematics, basically, uh, you would maybe want to use uh, different notations. For example, this is the edge set notation. There's adjacency list here and adjacency matrix. And each of these, uh, they're in a way equivalent or they show the same information, uh, but in a bit different way. And um, they have maybe different sort of uses. Um, um, yeah. Uh, okay, that's it. So there, there are kind of uh, three different ways. I think there might be more, uh, but these are maybe the most commonly used and they relate directly to how we would in a way represent graphs or implement graphs in a computer program like in Python. Um, yeah, we will basically use uh, maybe, uh, well, we will, in our coding, we will probably use this adjacency list or so kind of there's a list of vertices and each list of vertices basically stores what are the neighbors of that vertex. Um, that's it. So this we will do with um, classes and objects in Python. Then another big topic today is seller automation. So you maybe notice that I'm using sometimes seller automation or automate. I just realized there's again a typo here. So there's a process of seller automation. Then seller automata is the plural or so different seller um, uh, seller automata or uh, uh, seller automaton is the singular or so single single model. So the, these terms are. Uh, they sound similar, but they're derived from Latin. So that's why in plural, we say seller automata. Uh, and basically these are discrete models of computation. At the very beginning of this course, I mentioned that we will look into a few models of computation throughout the course and seller automata, or um, there are also these so-called concurrent uh, models of computation. Um, so that was one of them that I listed there at the very, in, in the very first lecture. So he, here it is. And basically, <clears throat> you can imagine um, having a grid. This can be one dimensional grid, um, meaning just a line of cells, or two dimensional or three dimensional grid. So you can have it in multiple uh, dimensions. And for every cell, you define a neighborhood. And then, depending on how the neighbor, the states of the neighbors, you basically define how them. So based on the states of neighbors, you define a rule how to evolve the system into the future. Okay, that's kind of the simplest, simplest that I can sort of put it. Um, originally, the states, you would have only two states. So 
on or off, or sometimes in Hughes Conway's Game of Life, then it would be called dead or alive. Um, but basically, those are just two binary states, like white or black. And um, yeah, then in one D cellar automata, would define a neighborhood. Well, obviously here you have only two neighbors, and then here on the bottom you have sort of the result or the rule. If you have these neighbors, so you have the state of the cell, and you have two neighbors which are in these states, then this is the result. And that's it. That's kind of how you evolve the system into the future, and um, and you apply it recursively, or so apply it then um, at every at every iteration. Uh, yeah, and typically the rules are sort of the same for every cell and the neighborhood is local or so you would have kind of a, a neighborhood is basically just the cells that are around that cell. Um, that's it. So it's, it's in a way very simple, but as you will see later, you can do quite a lot uh, already with just that. Okay, and then a little bit connection between these two topics. Uh, turns out that basically cellar automata are these models of, comput of computation they can be modeled using graphs. Um, that's it. So uh, basically mat, uh, graphs are sort of a mathematical structure. And in a way, all cellar automata models are basically graphs with some additional structure. Um, again, this is not always super evident, but uh, that's in a way their, uh, their relation. Um, and actually turns out that there's a, a step sort of a bit kind of missing there. There's a third topic, uh, so-called Boolean networks which are sort of feedback network models. And actually, um, Boolean networks are in a way more uh, like more directly related to solar automata. So basically, Boolean networks are types of graphs with additional structure where every node would um, have one of two states. And that's why they're called Booleans. Uh, that's, the, that's where the Boolean term comes from. And networks, it means that they are somehow, um, these nodes are related to each other and they, they um, uh, there's a feedback happening between different nodes. Um, so basically, Boolean networks, you know, uh, in a way, in certain, in a certain array, in certain arrangements, they they are basically cellular automata models. Or so they are kind of again, they are a bit similar. But they work a little bit different because the neighborhoods are defined differently. The, um, but uh, yeah, they, they are basically um, uh, they are related directly. Okay, and this is sort of a Boolean network. We will not really work with these. Um, so that's that's not a topic of the course. We will not go into them at all, but I just wanted to put them here uh, to show you. So here again, we have nodes. You can see it's basically a graph. Uh, the nodes have certain states, in this case, Boolean states, and then there are rules. Uh, rules basically uh, how these states are updated, and then we iterate uh, through states. Or so basically, the uh, these nodes are then sort of switching their states. And uh, again, very abstract model. But basically, um, these, one, these Boolean networks can be used in biology or are used in biology to model regulatory networks. For example, uh, gene expression. Or so if you think of your DNA uh, molecule, uh, there are certain genes and the genes can be expressed in different ways and their expression depends on, the, um, on, on other genes that are on the same DNA strand, let's say, or on some other strands. Uh, and in a way, you can kind of map the genes onto nodes and then kind of um, their relationships are sort of, um, or these rules are sort of mapped through, um, through basically how, so which genes regulate, you know, turning on or off or expression basically of other genes. And it and, and turns out that um, you can use that to uh, model many, many things uh, in the cell. Or so in a way our DNA molecules, again, they, they behave a little bit like these Boolean networks. and. And then kind of random Boolean networks um, is, um, is a huge topic in uh, uh, complex designs are. Okay, but th these are also some types of uh, kind of computational models are They're a bit more complex and, and um, yeah, it's a kind of a big, big research field. Okay, so a little bit back to the graph, uh, to kind of graphs. Um, so again, here on the top left, you have basically a uh, very simple graph, three nodes, um, and where all nodes are connected, then we can imbue or kind of um, add additional structure to a graph. For example, we can say uh, the, uh, the edges are, they have a direction or so uh, it's a directional graph then. So I see a directed graph. Um, so 
this would be on the left, you, this would be a uh, bi-directional graph. Or so the direction doesn't matter, the, just the adjacency or connection matters. Or, but we can kind of add a direction to this connection. Um, or we can add uh, weights. This is actually weighted. Um, yeah, so um, we can kind of add weights. We can add weights to the edges as well as to the nodes. Or, so we can say, not all the edges are the same. There's a certain weight. And you can think of this, for example, as a traffic network. Or these are maybe some points in the city. Nodes are points in the city. And the connections between them are roads. But we don't really see how, uh, we don't really see how the road looks like. But we have the length of the road. Or maybe um, you know, the type of the road, how many cars can pass there, um, and so on. So basically, again, your Google Maps uh, works by basically turning a whole city into a huge graph and then models sort of um, connections between different you know street addresses uh, by basically um, adding weights to these to these edges um, okay this is another example bottom left of uh, using adjacency matrix uh, it's a bit small i apologize but uh, you can use a adjacency matrix where basically you have vertices um, listed as columns and rows and then you use either zeros or ones uh, zeros and ones to indicate if there is a connection between the nodes or not. And this is great for small graphs, but if you have a big, big graphs that have sparse connections, so-called sparse graphs, then the matrix becomes very big and unwieldy. And then it's a bit better to use maybe this adjacency list where you basically um, only the, you, you're just listing the connections that exist. You're not listing the connections that, that are not there. And in the adjacency matrix, also the non-existent um, the non-existent uh, uh, connections are also listed as, for example, zeros. Uh, so entering the matrix would be zero. So um, so yeah, depending on kind of what is uh, what is more convenient, uh, you can use e e uh, either of these representations. Okay, so again, graph theory is a big field in mathematics, uh, and turns out that there are um, many graph types are actually named. So they have specific names. Like these are, for example, wheel graphs here. They look a little bit like wheels are. Then there are cycle graphs, which are maybe not shown here. Uh, but yeah, um, so there are kind of different graph, graph types. And what we see here, there are basically, these are basically embeddings of the graph. Or so graph can be embedded in different ways. So in a way, the picture of the graph is not the same as the graph itself. Um, so you can kind of imagine, a, you know, you can move the vertices around, or so the um, the actual position of these vertices doesn't matter. It's just what matters are connections. Uh, so in a way, we encode topology, but not the geometry. Or the this image here that you see, this is basically a shape. A shape has geometry, where every vertex has its um, has a specific position. But graphs don't encode positions, or they just encode relationships. So, but we have to somehow show it, or it's often convenient to show these relationships as a this kind of embedded graph uh, image in that sense. Okay, um, a bit of history. Um, the first, so the um, uh, Leonard Euler, uh, 18th century, the, uh, the seven bridges of uh, Königsberg uh, was the kind of first graph, basically theoretical problem that was formulated and kind of the first graph theory proof uh, that was made. So. Uh, where in a way you had a city of Königsberg, which has seven bridges. And the question was, can you actually visit all seven bridges uh, by, if you're, for example, a tourist, you want to visit all seven bridges, uh, but you don't want to pass the same bridge twice. Is this possible or not? And Euler basically proved that this is not possible. So he kind of uh, abstracted land masses into nodes and the bridges are then these um, edges. And he proved that basically, um, I don't know now exactly the technicality, but I think it's called, uh, I will, might do it wrong. I think it's called the o o Euler path. So basically uh, uh, a way to visit every vertex only um, only once. And um, yeah, but I'm, uh, yeah, you have to basically pass all the edges, trace all the edges without passing the vertex twice. And turns out that this is not possible. So you eventually would have to pass uh, one bridge twice. Uh, okay, so that was the first problem that kind of kick-started the whole field. And um, yeah, one example is, for example, uh, this is a Sudoku puzzle, probably know. 
uh, Sudoku can basically be reduced to a graph coloring problem. Um, so this is a graph, a Sudoku graph, and the, the, the rules here are basically the, uh, there are also connections that you don't really see because they go, I think, along these lines, but the idea is that you have to color this graph in a way that uh, two vertices of the same color are not connected directly. Um, that's it. And then basically colors become numbers and, um, and sort of uh, these conditions of what is, you know, uh, which numbers are allowed to be in each row, um, column, and sort of square uh, are this encoded through basically adding a connection uh, in the graph. Or so basically, uh, when you're solving Sudoku, you're solving a graph coloring problem, uh, but in a way, you get an incomplete graph, and then you have to solve the graph coloring problem. That's it. So uh, these two problems are actually equivalent. Um, a little bit more architectural example. So at least since the 80s, I see here, uh, since the 80s, so already kind of 30 years, architects um, have been looking into spatial problems um, in design as a kind of graph problems. Or so you could have, for example, arrangement of rooms. You can think of a, you know, if you have arrangement of rooms and you're just describing which room is connected to which other room, like, you know, entrance is connected to bathroom, to one, you know, to maybe all the rooms. Then uh, you have the kitchen, but kitchen is only connected to the entrance and the living room, and living room is maybe only connected to the kitchen. Um, so there's no direct you know, connection between the living room and the kitchen. Uh, this you can actually, this information you can encode in a graph. Um, so the graph is a perfect structure to, to hold this information. And, um, and yeah, then basically the, uh, you can kind of go the other way around. You can say, I have adjacency requirements. So I, again, very small, I apologize, but you can zoom in the PDF. Um, I can define, for example, different rooms in a, in a building or in, a, in an apartment. And I can say, these ones need to be connected together and these ones not. Uh, and, uh, and then I model these relationships. And then from then I can try to derive how does the floor plan need to look like. Or so I can go kind of back and forth. And this is one other example, so constraint graph for site layout or so kind of a, um, a site layout, I think there are different buildings and you can see maybe these are kind of roads and sort of uh, you encode these requirements of which lots need to be close to which other lots or which connections need to exist. You encode these through this sort of basically a graph, uh, graph di diagram. So this is not a spatial diagram. This is a topological diagram or so it just encodes relationships. Okay, then a little bit more into graph theory. So not too much, but um, there are certain operations uh, that you can perform on graphs. Graphs, for example, you can, if you have a graph, you can get a dual graph, which is sort of like an inverse of the graph. Uh, so that's shown here. It's a little bit similar, like, I think it's also been shown here. Um, no, I'm not actually exactly sure, but uh, I think dual graphs are used here as well. Okay, then you can do different operations on them. This is, uh, upright is the tensor product of graphs. So, um, you can define an operation where you can combine two graphs to get a third one. There's a tensor product, this is a Cartesian product, and this is a strong product, which is kind of a combination of these two. Or so you can sort of start combining them and um, get different graphs. You can construct different, different graphs um, using these, these operations, like graph algebra. Mm. Then uh, one big topic in graph, so sort of uh, why graphs are still being researched is because they are um, essential to complex networks or complex network analysis. Or so this is, for example, um, uh, two different uh, graph search types, or you can imagine again, if, if I have a Google maps and I define, I want to move from point A to point B, basically I'm looking uh, for a path through that network. Or so in a way I'm trying to solve um, I'm doing path search on a graph. And then uh, that's again a, a big uh, field of research where you can have, um, then you, know, you can look at techniques like depth first search or breadth first search. Then there's this, I was uh, unfortunately can never pronounce this name, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm or so that I think it was a Dutch guy uh, who invented them, basically a very efficient search algorithm. So if I have a graph and I have point A and B and um, I want to find the shortest path between these two. Uh, I can use uh, the algorithm. And 
modification of that algorithm is literally what kind of again on Google Maps finds the point, uh, finds your you know connection between A and B. So that's literally what kind of Google is using, and of course social networks uh, function a little bit like complex networks, um, and um, and you know you can think of uh, you know degrees of separation between friends. So with the onset of internet and specifically social media, um, kind of the basically complex network uh, uh, complex network field sort of exploded in application. And again, graphs are basically um, what uh, you use to model these networks. So that's why kind of graph theory is sort of uh, uh, quite there, uh, very active field of research. And this is one just curious example that I found. This is called um, uh, weighted planar stochastic lattice. So it's a, also somehow like a graph. Uh, so it is like a complex network, but represented through through um, adjoined rectangles, um, where basically, um, yeah, kind of the DAC. Um, so this lattice basically has a, as you know, few cells or a few of these um, rectangles that have uh, a lot of connections, which is um, which is um, a property of complex networks. So if you look at the, uh, you know, again, friendship networks on. Facebook or on Instagram, like uh, who follows who, you will see that there are very few nodes with exponentially um, many followers or friends, uh, whereas there's a lot of nodes that have very few friends or so that there's a um, there's an asymmetry there or in this kind of, uh, this way this planar stochastic lattice is kind of encoding that, but not through nodes, but sort of through through small um, small rectangle, kind of rectangle areas or lot of hands, let's say. Okay. So those are graphs, and um, now a little bit about solar automata. So basic elements, uh, we have sort of a grid, in this case, a two-dimensional grid, and these um, cells can have different states. So this is a, a gomoku, so it's a, this ancient Japanese um, game. Um, it's, um, you can play it on the same board that you play Go. Uh, so uh, basically, you have black and white stones, and you have to put, I think, five in a row. Um, or you can play just Go where you have to sort of surround uh, other cells. So in a way, when you play Go, you're in a way a little bit um, playing with the sort of a cellar automata uh, model or because there are rules on sort of neighborhoods and patches and so on. Um, this is how a neighborhood is defined or so you have an X a coordinate X, Y. This is just relative to the grid, some X and Y coordinate. And then these are the neighbors of this cell here. So this is in a two two dimensional grid, and this is how we can get to every neighbor. There are actually eight neighbors. Uh, we'll look a bit deeper into this Conway's game of life, which is um, yeah, cellar uh, automata model defined on a two D grid with very specific rules that make this model specifically behave uh, very organically. Or and uh, Stephen Wolfram, um, the guy who invented and is running uh, Wolfram Alpha, the computational engine. Uh, he is very interested in, um, he does a lot of research in solar automata, and he was also looking into, for example, three-dimensional solar automata and so on. So he wrote this book, A New Kind of Science, which is unfortunately not in the reading list, but uh, you should for sure kind of have a look at it. Actually, I maybe put it there, but I don't really have any scans from that book, so uh, I didn't put it in, but it's a great reference when it comes to um, yeah, CAs, CA models. Okay, and then um, Conway's Game of Life. So Conway started researching these um, uh, cell, cell automata models basically, in, I think it was in the 60s when the computers, uh, where basically computers got graphical interfaces. So you could sort of, um, you could sort of see what's happening on the screen, even though I think maybe the first iterations were um, not on an interactive display, but maybe again on punch cards or something. Uh, so, so yeah, the, there's a, um, I didn't actually list the rules here, uh, but there are just very few rules on how the cells are updated. And it turns out that you can construct then tons of tons of things that look um, look a little bit alive uh, in this uh, in this model of computation. Or so these are, for example, here oscillators. So these are patterns that kind of oscillate. They have period. Uh, this I think also an oscillator. Then you have. Um, uh, so-called spaceships, so kind of structures that move through the grid. This is one, this is the second one. And then there are so-called still lives or so the structures that don't move. And it turns out that you can use 
so with these very few structures, uh, this is enough to create um, Turing complete. Uh, so to get kind of Turing complete in source of this, uh, the game of life is Turing complete. That means you can use it to compute um, to compute anything or anything anything that is computable can be computed using game of life. So this is a um, theoretical, let's say, find that we already or that even I mean um, uh, Conway already knew about uh, because there are certain conditions that you need to meet in order to um, get this property of Turing completeness. But only recently somebody actually managed to construct. An actual computer, or so the somebody constructed a Turing machine inside Game of Life, or so Solar Automata. So it, it is a um, it is a simulation of a computer inside uh, inside another simulation of a computer. Yeah, or so it is basically a simulated computer inside a computer. Uh, so and unfortunately, again, this is very small, so you can't really see what's happening, but. Uh, but yeah, so the, it kind of got got quite crazy, and this is also a very active area of research uh, these days. So again, very simple rules, but very very complex uh, behaviors. Unfortunately, uh, um, uh, Conway actually passed away last year due to coronavirus. So um, he was one of those, uh, unfortunately, one of those victims. There was an article I think last year. Um, uh, they wrote a lot about kind of his life and his legacy. Um, but yeah, he was kind of, he just passed away last year, but yeah, he invented the game. Okay, um, a little bit now, this was a bit step forward, but if you take just a little bit step back, uh, again, solar automata models are uh, also kind of a field of active research. So uh, there's a um, guy called Bankton who sort of defined a um, so-called lambda, lambda parameter. So for different solar automata models, um, which is sort of, um, parameter that tries to quantify complexity uh, of the model. And um, he kind of postulated that uh, there are only four different types. There are the fixed types or stable. They are very boring because they don't really change a lot. Then there are peri periodic ones, uh, meaning that they, um, they kind of, for whatever input you put in, you always get kind of a very periodic sort of repetitive behavior. Then on the other end, you have chaotic behavior. Um, meaning you get basically pseudo randomness in a deterministic system that may be interesting. Actually, I think that's this one here. And then in between you have, in between periodic and chaotic, you have complex behavior. Uh, and there that's where the kind of things get really interesting. And we will do, we will actually try to do today um, as an example, this one, the solar automata, which will then plot as a grid. So we'll try to do exactly this. And, by changing the parameters, we'll try to basically get a different, um, uh, different, try to basically, yeah, get different, um, different results. So we'll try to maybe probe uh, to get different types of these. Now for 1D seller automata, the things are very simple because you only have eight different configurations. So if you have a cell that has a certain state and that state uh, that, that there, um, there are also only two neighbors. So I have three cells, so to the, Two to the power of three is eight, so I have only eight different um, situations, and this you can quantify very easily. So you can literally write just a like an if loop or a if conditional, where you list all eight possibilities, and that's exactly what we will do today. And because there are only eight of these, uh, um, or eight of these sort of different configurations, it means we have uh, two to the power of eight different rule sets for this one, the solar automata to the power eight is, mm, might be wrong, but I think it's 256. Uh, so there are only 256 rule sets and then still enroll from the guy that I mentioned before, who wrote this nice book, the, a new kind of science. He basically said, hey, come on, 256. We, I'll just list literally all of them, you know? So he went one by one and he just categorized them um, and said, these ones are fixed. These ones are periodic, these ones are chaotic, these ones are complex. So he, on, when you go on his website, uh, he literally has you know, names for them, codes. Um, so let's say if your rule set is very small, it is maybe the smallest one that, that it can get, uh, you can literally list all the different uh, variations. Unfortunately, already for 2D example, like Conway's Game of Life, this is not possible. Or, so that's a bit kind of a big story here is, I hope it, comes across is that you can have a simple 
systems that are you know finite in size um, that have fixed granularity or they have a certain resolution they're not infinitely divisible you have a fixed rule set uh, but you still cannot and it's a deterministic rule set or so uh, when you run them so there's there are no randomness here or so there's nothing random like the rules are defined uh, and they're deterministic but you still cannot really predict the evolution of the system you cannot predict how a game of life iteration will evolve or and that's again related a bit in mathematics to uh, the so-called halting problem uh, and the kind of Gödel's um, incompleteness theorem so there's some interesting topics from uh, kind of computer science that, that feed into their mathematics. But for us, maybe maybe the imp most important takeaway is that uh, if you like, you know, simple systems are maybe simple and you, we can predict their behavior. But if you add just few extra rules, we basically cannot predict the behavior of the system in long term. Um, and, uh, and that's actually fascinating. That's fascinating because it kind of tells us a little bit uh, if this is already true for these simple systems, how more so than for um, a, like, you know, life, um, you know, molecules, like, you know, physical matter, uh, cells and so on. Or so when somebody, you know, you talk with philosophers about the determinism of life and, and so on. So maybe go into a bit uh, religious topics then, and then, um, and this is sort of um, uh, this you should be kind of a little bit aware of. I think um, there's some very very interesting, also philosophical topics here. Okay, not to go not to become too philosophical. Let's go further. Mm. Applications of solar automata models. So it turns out you can model simple organisms um, like uh, slime mold. You can do this simulation. So the aggregation of slime mold. Uh, slime mold is this organism that kind of um, sometimes it's a unicellular, unicellular organisms, and when it's more convenient, then it becomes a multicellular, or so it kind of starts shifting. Uh, there is this is an example of smoothing, so you can go from kind of a random noise into sort of a smoothed out structure. Uh, and this we can actually code, and we'll do it next time because it requires a bit more code. But um, yeah, we'll do this sort of uh, smoothing, smoothing automata. And this is used again in procedural modeling and kind of computer games a lot. Um, then another type of smoothing is this uh, kind of, actually, I'm not sure if these two are maybe the same. Yeah, I apologize, I'm not exactly sure. So th there's, a, I think there might be a little bit different, uh, but you can use the same, same rules of, for example, modeling uh, uh, tree lines or so kind of the, the formation of a forest edge is in a way can be explained with uh, this sort of simple cellular automata model or so if you again i'm not a landscape architect and don't know much about trees but uh, what i do know is that when you have few trees that already form that are kind of close together they tend to form clusters or so the individual trees tend to die out sort of the yeah the individual trees kind of tend to die out because they're exposed to weather and if you already have a little bit of density they this clusters tend to densify further. And that's why the kind of, that's how the sort of uh, the forests are created. And the, the forest edge is never a straight line unless it's cut by humans. It always kind of forms this sort of basic grows or, and again, this you can explain uh, using solar automata and kind of very simple, uh, simple rules. And then going down the scale, um, the same, Again, very, very small, I apologize. Uh, you can look into these so-called uh, Ising models. So Ising models uh, for ferromagnetism. So basically how material gets magnetized or demagnetized can also be explained by sort of um, crystal lattices and then kind of atoms there having, you know, uh, being piled bipolar and having different orientations. And basically sometimes you get alignment. So you get kind of a magnetic material and sometimes you get misalignment and then you get, um, um, you know, demagnetized material. So you can kind of explain um, phase transitions of materials basically using like an solar automata model. So they are very, very versatile. Another example, which we will also do, but again, next time and maybe not from scratch, is you can actually describe uh, rainfall or movement of water or kind of yeah, the flow of water down the hill. So you can actually simulate quantities also because you can say, this is our familiar model, if you remember, um, like a mountain model, where 
there are these sort of point clouds or kind of pixels. Uh, there are different heights, and we put certain stack of material on top, so just water. And um, then we make that water basically go from a higher point to the lower point. That's it. And it kind of flows faster toward the lower point than toward maybe the side points. Um, so the water is kind of flowing then toward uh, uh, you know, the lo lowest point. And you basically simulate the um, uh, movement of water. Or so you kind of populate this terrain with individual particles. And they will sort of shift toward the lower, 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 lower uh, positions. And yeah, then you basically have streams, water flow, and so on. And you can add, for example, erosion. So you can say when the when the particle shifts to the lower level, it erodes um, it, it erodes the part of the terrain there. So kind of the terrain there becomes a bit lower uh, because it kind of the water carries the material uh, and so on. And and this basically simulates erosion. Or so you can kind of simulate erosion effects using uh, solar automata. Of course, here they are very um, very high resolution or, or to get kind of the best the best effects. Okay, and then some other examples. In terms of there are these um, um, so-called lattice Boltzmann models, uh, which are used to simulate um, kind of fluids, so fluid dynamics using lattice Boltzmann uh, me method, which are again type of solar automata. Uh, so you don't need to use Navier Stokes equations, which are sort of work on a continuum, but you can work in a discretized way and simulate uh, fluids. Another here on the right, you see another example from uh, the book A New Kind of Science by Stephen Wolfram, uh, basically generating snowflakes using solar automata models. So, kind of again, uh, he has a very elaborate system of rules how these are created. And Again, a good ex like if you're interested in you know doing a mini project, uh, so in two weeks you can basically say, hey, I'm gonna do this in Rhino in Python. So I actually tried once and didn't invest enough time, but it's not very hard. And if you get the book, I think you can also find. I think the book is also actually online. He literally explains how how he does. It. So like everything is explained. You just need to code it in Python or and do it in Rhino. That's it. So um, the rules are actually very simple. Or so and you can get kind of multitude of um, so many, many different uh, variations. So this is how you can sort of generate snowflakes. Something a little bit related are is this um, so-called wave function collapse algorithm, which uh, again, we will not go into, but uh, uh, maybe I can show some other examples later. You can kind of go from, you can sort of have an example image and you can learn the features of that image and you can kind of extrapolate it onto a bigger pattern. And again, this is used in precision modeling. It, I will show this example again when we talk about learning toward the end of the course. Um, but basically, this is again using a kind of a grid, and there are cells, and the cells can have multiple states, and there's a probability of how the states are sort of correlated. And um, yeah, it's inspired by the wave function from uh, quantum mechanics. So that's why it's called the wave function collapse algorithm. And again, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that in some future uh, future lectures. Uh, last example, um, you can actually discretize your, if you have a floor plan, for example, in an architectural design, you can discretize your whole floor plan into cells. And you can say some cells are sort of walls and some cells are sort of insides of the buildings. So you can kind of, if you work with rectangular arrangements and as you know, a lot of architecture is, uh, is kind of arranged in a rectangular way, you can, uh, you can kind of, you can basically turn your uh, floor plan into a sort of a stellar automata model and perform sort of optimization and computation and variation uh, using that, basically using this kind of a uh, grid. So one other example that I didn't show, but uh, could maybe be also related is like Lego blocks. Or if you have Lego blocks, I have again, discretized um, you know, blocks that fit together and, and uh, they are kind of part of a grid and there may be different rules have different Lego blocks coming together. Okay, uh, that's it. So two topics uh, or two texts that I gave you here that uh, I suggest reading until next time. So they are in our text uh, library. Um, the first one is from Christopher Alexander, and this is actually a kind of a short essay. It's called Systems Generating Systems, and it's part of this. It was part of this AD Reader Computational Design Thinking. Uh, you might know Christopher Alexander as the writer of uh, A Pattern Language, which is an amazing book. 
um, that I would recommend. I think if you're an architect, you should have it on your shelf. Uh, but this is not pattern language, but it's kind of a little bit related maybe. Um, yeah, it's kind of, you know, before he, so, you know, this was, I think, again, I forgot the, exactly the year, I'll have to look, uh, but I think it actually says here 1968. Okay, so it's in the 60s, computers were already around, but uh, not really widely used, uh, at least not in the design field, but kind of, you know, Christopher Alexander sort of understood that there is something, there are some relations between emerging science of um, computers, computer science, complex systems. Of course, in that time, it was also cybernetics was, uh, which we would today maybe called complex systems, complex feedback systems and control. Uh, some that is used in, you know, um, robotics today or kind of, a, again, um, um, system, uh, dynamic systems and control, let's say, but back in the day, it was called cybernetics. And basically, Christopher Alexander, who is an architect, is kind of reflecting on these on these uh, technologies and how they could impact uh, design. Right? And really talking about basically that, you know, what is you know, the generation in design or so kind of what could, you know, the generative potential of these sort of, um, um, of these systems, let's say. So that's why he calls them systems generating systems. So yeah, kind of talking a lot about computational design without directly referring to computers but more like communication and like telecommunication networks and so on. So in a way, I think that this text was way more ahead of its time. That's why it maybe didn't get enough traction uh, back in the day because people just didn't really understand what he was talking about. Um, because many architects, of course, maybe never used, well, never used computer in, the, in their lives at that time. So there was kind of something quite progressive about this text. I suggest you kind of, I think it's a short read, so you should uh, definitely go through it. And another text is Elements of Parametric Design by Robert, uh, Robert Woodbury. Uh, it's a bit more contemporary example, so only 11 years old. And um, it's also just part of the book. And um, actually the examples that I showed you at the very beginning, uh, we're kind of talking about floor plans as sort of graphs, um, in a way, relationships between different um, rooms in a plan can be described through sort of graphs and then these graphs, we can, uh, we can add additional structure to the graphs and basically use this as a framework for um, you know, our design. This is in general uh, described, described in, this, um, in this chapter of the book. So it's actually, I think the chapter is called how designers use parameters. Um, so yeah, kind of a, again, directly relates to this uh, topics that I talked about today.